Um, I got into this work about five years ago um, or so when I went to a small town named Oak Harbor, Washington, which is a little military town, invited to go with a Muslim friend of mine and try to counter some of the anti-Muslim bigotry there. We ended up doing five of those uh, in a series uh, throughout Western Washington State. And what I began to realize was that everywhere we went, we heard the same questions and almost the same language, saw the same fear, saw the same hate and prejudice in all those different, different locations. And of course, those people didn't know each other. So how is it that they were all saying the same thing? How come their messaging was so consistent, even though they didn't know each other? And I began to do some really, uh, really significant study into why, um, why these messages were the same. And of course, it's that there's anti-Muslim hate groups working overtime uh, to actually um, dehumanize our American Muslim neighbors, that there's an intentional campaign of dehumanization against our Muslim neighbors. And I knew that um, when I was in seminary as a Lutheran pastor, we heard about the dehumanization campaign against our Jewish neighbors in Germany. And we all sat around the cafeteria, you know, after those classes and said, you know, if we saw that sort of thing happening, you know, in our time, we're going to say something. And I realized fairly quickly that I needed to spend uh, a lot of my life, and I, in fact, resigned from churches to be able to do this work. And, of course, the, the folk in Western Washington that heard, that asked those questions, that repeated those messages, they, they aren't alone. Um, in the United States, uh, in, in PPP polling, did a, a study in 2015 of, of uh, voters that were likely to vote, asking, should the U.S. bomb Agrabah, uh, an Arabic-sounding uh, city name? and 25% were in favor automatically, and 51% were not sure. And of course, the problem is that Agrabah does not exist except in the Disney film Aladdin. And so there's this, this sort of bias against Islam, against Arabic sounding uh, names of city names. And if you think carefully for a minute, like what's in a city? But people were all of a sudden, 25% were ready to bomb it, and 51% weren't sure even though they could not possibly have had any policy reason for, for doing so. So a guy named Irvin Staub, who I've been reading some of his books lately, uh, one called The Roots of Evil. And he says that, that countries uh, that have a, con have a context in which um, mass violence against groups of people becomes more likely. And, and one of the self-concepts that he's found, uh, one of the, is, is a, a mixture of superiority and self-doubt or persecution. We can actually hear this in the current occupant of the White House that talks about how great America is, but how some Americans are being persecuted. And if we could just get rid of those other people, everything would be great. And then the whole thing rinses and repeats. But what he's also found, uh, Professor Staub has also found that difficult life conditions also are an important uh, ingredient to, pro to pro providing a situation where people could do mass violence to each other. And if you think about our current situation, we've got 50% of Americans are chronically lonely. Uh, we've got wealth and income inequality at levels higher than they were uh, around the time of the Great Depression. Wages have been flat, but we've seen an incredible increase in rent and also in home prices. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of folk in our country really struggling. And now that the pandemic is here, we're not only seeing uh, unjust impacts of the pandemic economically on people of color, but, uh, but there's about 40% a, a of, the, of the economy is just like really fallen to the ground. And another third seems to be doing just fine. Um, also, he found in his study of, of cultures that, that, that begin to do mass violence toward people, that there's a kind of a longstanding racism that often uh, is a justification for, for that mass violence. Now, in his later book, Roots of Goodness, he, he proposes that there's, there's one thing that can make a huge difference, and that is people moving from being passive bystanders, watching a group of people get dehumanized, and be, people becoming active bystanders. And this is what he says. Opposition from bystanders, whether based on moral or other grounds, can change the perspective of perpetrators and other bystanders, especially if the bystanders act at an early point on the continuum of destruction. And if there's one thing this whole thing is about for us, is we wanna encourage you to go from being a passive bystander to being an active bystander, whether it's with the Muslim community or the Jewish community, the Latinx community, 
the African American community, I mean, whoever. But but all of all of these groups need need assistance from people to who who move from being passive bystanders and wishing them well to actively working uh, for their humanity. So Ibram X. Kendi in his wonderful book, Stamp from the Beginning, uh, really challenges one of our notions about how hate gets started. We all think that racism and, and policies that, that don't make sense, policies that disadvantage people of color, people of different religious traditions, starts with hate. But what he actually says is it starts with economic and political self-interest of a few people. Right, and then these people then create racially discriminatory policies that benefit them and disadvantage the smaller groups in the country. These then that get justified by racist ideas, which then begin to generate hate and ignorance in the larger population. And then over time, all of these begin to feed on each other. We also know right now in our country that we're having a serious conversation about race and racism. And, uh, and, and we typically talk about racism as having four expressions, intrapersonal, interpersonal, institutional, and structural. Often in our public conversations, of course, we talk about racism as if it's only interpersonal nastiness. But we know that that's only one part of kind of a matrix or the expressions of racism that are important for us to deal with. And so as I've gotten to think about Islamophobia and doing the work that I've been doing, I've realized that I have a lot of intrapersonal racism toward Muslims. I have a lot of Islamophobia in me. And one of the most painful and rewarding parts of the work that I've been doing is being able to con confront uh, the Islamophobia within me and do some of that internalized work. And I've met many Muslims who themselves have said that they experience some intrapersonal racism as if some of the racism of the larger country infects them and, and begins to impact them. And so what do Muslims teach each other about, about this situation? Oh, mankind, we have created you from a male and female and have made you into nations and tribes for you to know one another. And uh, now, so the fact that there's diversity and difference in religion and culture and every other kind of difference within the human community, that's not a bug. That's not a problem. That's a feature of the creation made by the creator. So in other words, we're all here to get to know each other and to welcome each other in peace. But we also know that racism uh, also has a lot of interpersonal expression. We know that in the last number of years, total anti-Muslim bias incidents have been on the rise. We know that anti-Muslim hate crimes have been on the rise, as well as toward other groups, including our Jewish neighbors. And so what do Muslims teach about interpersonal you know, challenges, interpersonal expressions of racism? Well, essentially the same thing that many other religions teach, that the good deed and the evil deed are not equal. Repel by that which is better, and then behold, the one between whom and thee there is enmity shall be as if he were a loyal protecting friend. In other words, this is a similar teaching to Jesus saying, pray for those that persecute you, do good to those who harm you, love your enemies. But we also know that institutional expressions of racism are really critical uh, as, as they impact our, our Muslim sisters and brothers. So one example of this was a Cargill, a, an, an agricultural uh, firm, uh, would not allow their Muslim workers to use a break room to pray throughout the day. And the Teamsters Union refused to stand up with them. And ultimately they had to take both of them to court and they won a settlement regarding that. So we see both a union and a an agricultural conglomerate basically engaging in institutional racism toward our Muslim sisters and brothers. We know from a study from the Institute for, for Social Policy and Understanding that, um, that about 42% of all Muslim families experience some bullying at least once a year, some many more times a year. And that 25% of the time, that bullying comes from a teacher or an administrator. We know when it comes to the media that we've got some serious institutional Islamophobia where people who perpetrate violent crimes, if they're perceived to be Muslim, receive well over two times the amount of media coverage as people who do similar crimes and who are not perceived to be Muslim. Take, for example, uh, Dylan Roof. Um, when have you heard in the media a long conversation or repeated conversation about his uh, faith tradition? Actually, Dylan Roof was a Lutheran, the same, same denomination as I, 
And I've never once been asked uh, by anybody to justify myself based on his actions. I've never been blamed for his actions. Uh, most of the time, uh, and Dylan Roof was never called a radical Lutheranist. Um, and yet if he was Muslim, I think the story would be different. We also know that many parts of the Christian church uh, express a great deal of institutional Islamophobia. But I need to say that I've been in over 120 churches since I first started this work, and I've yet to find one, even those who consider themselves very progressive or moderate or, or, or whatever, um, that, that has been devoid of, of Islamophobia of some kind. Um, there's a great deal of institutional Islamophobia throughout the Christian church. But just to be clear, there's also liberal Islamophobia in the media, as Bill Maher often speaks poorly of all religion, but applies, you know, very, very copious amounts of collective blame to our Muslim sisters and brothers. But there's one other institution that really takes the cake in all this and actually helps to generate a lot of the rest of it. And that is the Islamophobia industry. They spend about $30 million a year uh, at, creating a lot of uh, negative uh, impressions of our Muslim neighbors, actively dehumanizing them. Uh, and and they, they do so through lots of different methods. They use white papers to policymakers. They write books and YouTube videos that show up on our iPads while we're eating breakfast, uh, building networks, a lot of social media. They write blogs and they do media appearances. They lobby they do speaking tours, and they do messaging studies. They actually, as we said in the video, study how to make people fearful of their American Muslim neighbors. Like that's what they do. Uh, that active dehumanization, when I found that out, is what led me to do what I'm doing. Because I knew that I could not stand idly by and let that happen. Because that dehumanization is not good for any of us. These anti-Muslim hate groups have a lot of names. There's about 34 across the country. You know, two that I'll talk about today, one is Act for America and the other is the Center for Security Policy. Act for America, for instance, claims to have a weekly meeting at the White House. We don't know if that's true, but we've not seen anywhere the White House saying that this is not true. There's also the Center for Security Policy, who's run by a gentleman named Frank Gaffney, who was a Reagan administration official, and um, has intense and, and deep contacts throughout the neoconservative movement uh, in, in, uh, in the United States. And, uh, and these folk are working at a very high level in the current administration and throughout all of kind of the, the military industrial complex. And basically what they're doing is back to Abram X. Kendi's uh, idea that racism usually starts with political and economic and self-interests Essentially, what they're doing is they're trying to say that Muslims are a threat, you, you know, universally, um, so that they can sell more bombs and guns. That's really what they're what they're all about. But structurally, we also see a lot of racism toward our Muslim neighbors. So, of the thousand films in the previous century that were studied that had an a an Arab or a Muslim character, um, over 936 of those characters were, were negatively portrayed and only 12 were positive. If we look on, on TV news, we see that even though Muslims make up only 1% of the population, that they get about 50% of the coverage of religious folk in the country. And on the right side of the graph, we can see that only about 5% of that coverage is positive. Um, one example of this was the Washington Times, who in 2015 said that the majority of fatal attacks uh, on US soil carried out by white supremacists, not terrorists. Which is a way to sort of take that T word there and make it into a cultural epithet. That's essentially what they're doing. The New York Times, however, is, is, no, uh, is, is not innocent in this either. The New York Times refers to Muslims and Islam more negatively than cancer or cocaine. So found 416 labs in a study that they've done over the last 25 years in the New York Times. In our sentencing that happens in our courtrooms, there's tremendous structural racism. The average sentence sought is about three times higher for perceived Muslim uh, uh, perpetrators, and it's four times, they receive four times the amount of sentences. We see also across the country anti-Sharia legislation put into place by, by lawmakers and being argued for 
And of course, the purpose of those of those um, that legislation, as David Yeroshami, the guy who wrote um, who wrote the legislation, says, it, it would not have served its purpose without any friction. Like the purpose was heuristic to get people asking this question: What is Sharia? So the the point of some of these structural issues is that they help provide um, rationale for people holding personal hate. And this creates a, a really terrible cycle. We have, of course, structurally right now, our, our Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, with clear uh, and, and, and consistent um, connections to Act for America and for the Center of Security Policy. And when he was asked by Cory Booker uh, during his confirmation hearing if he would reject his connection to these hate groups, um, hate groups that are named hate groups by my by the both the ADL, um, by the Southern Poverty Law Center, and many others, Mike Pompeo would not renounce those connections. But we also know there's governmental Islamophobia, TSA boredom random checks that always seem to pull pull aside my friends who happen to be Muslim, no fly lists, uh, counteracting violent extremism that all too often focuses exclusively. Uh, on, on members of the Muslim community, surveillance programs that do the same. And of course, the Muslim ban that's keeping families apart and continuing to provide rationale to people in their own bigotry. So what do Muslims say about this? How do they respond to this? Well, what I've heard in, in their Islamic centers and mosques is, oh, you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents or relatives. So we know right now we've got a lot of racism, both intrapersonal, interpersonal, institutional, and structural coming at our Muslim neighbors. Um, and in the last century, I have a terrible number here to talk to you about. In the last century, 262 million people were killed by genocide uh, in, in the 20th century. Uh, 262 million people. And that doesn't just happen easily or by accident. Um, there's a wonderful scholar named Jonathan Leader Maynard who is studying uh, the, the kind of speech that leads to mass violence, kind of a pro psychological and speech process. And what he says is it starts out with an us and a them. Somebody says there's an us and a them, and they begin to dehumanize the people who are perceived to be other, calling them animals, uh, referring to them in, in really derogatory ways, that they're not really human for one reason or another, and then they begin to apply collective blame to that entire group for the actions of a few. Like for Christians, you know, we don't blame all Christians for the KKK. We certainly don't blame Jesus for it. But that often happens, that kind of collective blame happens toward, toward many other groups that are being dehumanized. And then constantly there's this notion of threat being, being portrayed, that, that, that this group is a threat to everybody else. And what happens with fear is that it becomes real, even if the threat isn't. So the fear is real. Um, and it's, it's palpable inside of people. When we do public presentations, Anil and I can see the fear in people, right? And usually we fear on the basis of that which we love, right? And so it's easy once we start to fear, but because we love our community, we love our family, we love our country, well, then, then, then we start to walk a very dangerous road. Um, then we're proposed by our leaders that there's no alternative, that we have to act now, but that if we act now, a beautiful, peaceful future awaits. And all of this is to say that most people who participate or who are passive bystanders with respect to, to, to mass violence are not seeking to do evil. This is the thing that's just hard to get into our hearts and heads, that they actually are are convinced that violence is necessary and even good and moral. And that is the, is the terrible danger of mass violence uh, be, that, that is created by dangerous speech, dehumanizing speech. And so here's the thing that we're gonna say to you is that you can play a part in counteracting that dangerous speech. Um, that you can play a part in, in helping people to understand that what they love, our Muslim neighbors also love, and that you also love. And that fear is infectious, but love can wash it away. But it, it takes much more time to, to create love 
and trust than it does to create fear. It's easier to create fear on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. It's much more difficult to create love. But we also believe fundamentally that as American citizens, it's the patriotic duty of every uh, citizen to protect the civil rights of all, knowing the best way to protect our own rights is to uphold everyone's rights. And we're actually, we're just asking you to consider uh, growing into being active bystanders and, or growing your skills in being active bystanders to stand with our American Muslim neighbors because, because there's a great amount of money, great amount of economic self-interest and, and policy and, um, and racist language and, and thought that is, that is arrayed against them right now. And they need as many uh, allies as they can get. And if you're called to stand with another group, um, amen. And we're so glad that you're going to do that too. And we hope that you will also be able to speak uh, positively of our Muslim neighbors.